Okay, good morning everybody. Welcome to day two of Africa Down Under. Um, my name is Bill Witham, I'm the CEO of AMEG and I'll be the chair of this session. Which uh, Today we've got three very interesting uh, exploration stories and also and then we'll talk with um, Phil on uh, some of the risk management stuff in Africa. So uh, just welcome to everybody here today at the conference but also remember that there are quite a few people streaming online and Please be aware that you can ask questions online and I have my iPad with me. So um, after the four talks this morning, we'll then be having a question session at, uh, at the end of the talks. All right, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Mike Christie. Mike is the Director of Exploration at First Quantum Minerals, FQ FQM, and he'll be giving us his African update. Thanks, Mike. Good morning. Thank you, Bill. Thank you to everybody that's... Uh, uh, managed to make this uh, this conference happen this year, which uh, I would take my hat off to the the Peter team um, for uh, keeping this going uh, in what has been a, a, an extraordinary uh, year for all of us, I'm sure. Um, a very good, very early morning to uh, those of you that may be tuning in from Africa or perhaps online later. Um, it's been uh, been a very odd year for for myself, running a global exploration team from Perth. Uh, and not being able to participate in things in the field. Um, but I think we've all found ways to operate, and, um, uh, and I want to spend a little time today talking about, about some of that. So today's uh, talk is, is not an exploration talk per se, although I will mention some exploration that we're doing in Africa. Um, but it's, it is focused on Africa. Uh, First Quantum, as you're probably aware, is a fairly global uh, base metal miner. Um, but we'll talk mostly about Africa today and some of the, uh, the good work that our, our team in Africa are, are, are doing. Um, cautionary statement that you can find on our website, should you wish to read it all. Um, just at a glance, uh, First Quantum, uh, fairly major copper producer. I think we'll make number six in the world this year. Um, some nice copper jewellery made in Zambia there. Um, but we also produce some, uh, fairly significant amounts of gold, zinc and nickel as well. Um, so last year's copper production, just over 700,000 tonnes, we hope to exceed that this year. Um, sales revenue in the order of 4 billion, uh, again, I think we'll exceed that this year, uh, and employees around the world of about 26,000, and 10,000 of those are in, in Zambia, uh, which is one of our, our biggest global operations. So rather than just put up the mines and what they produce and how many tonnes and how many profits they make, slightly different angle on this, this is the money that we paid in taxes and community projects to all the governments around the world. It totals a billion dollars in 2019. It's a significant amount. Uh, and I don't think this gets talked about enough in terms of the benefits that mining puts back into the various countries that we operate in. So if you look at the, the four northerly ones of those, they're relatively small operations in Finland, Spain and Turkey, uh, sadly coming close to the end of their lives, uh, and in Mauritania as well. Um, Three quarters of that overall uh, billion dollar spend went into Zambia and went directly into uh, government and uh, various community projects uh, in Zambia. So that's a very significant contribution to, uh, to the Zambian economy. Um, smaller amounts in Australia because Ravensthorpe was on care and maintenance last year. Uh, and Panama, our other big operation that I will speak about briefly towards the end of the talk, um, is, uh, is just, was just ramping up during 2019. That'll be a much larger number um, in the coming year. So the highs and lows of, uh, of 2020, uh, and I think we've all had a few of these. Um, the biggest ones for us, I guess, are that uh, our mine at Cobre Panama, which we had just built and started commissioning late last year, uh, was shut for four months um, from April through July this year. Um, and when you've got a $6 billion overdraft, that's, uh, that's pretty painful because uh, you're still paying a lot of interest on that. Um, and uh, it was painful for our employees um, and for the government in Panama as well. Uh, but there was an extraordinary uh, uh, cooperation between the government and, uh, and First Quantum with a workforce of uh, uh, over 3,500 people in order to put in place a whole series of, uh, of measures to ensure that, like Western Australia, we had a bubble uh, within uh, Panama whereby everybody quarantined, going in and out of the site. And it took us uh, several months to get that sorted and to do the deep cleaning on the site and to make sure that the, everything was set up appropriately. And we haven't had a case uh, of, of the COVID infection on site now since April. Um, and we now have a full workforce of three and a half thousand employees back on the site. Um, 
And the remarkable thing is that as a company, even though all of our sites around the world have been uh, affected uh, and impacted uh, by the pandemic, um, year on year, our copper production is up 10% on last year. Um, our revenue is up, our gross profit is up, uh, and um, we're even beginning to pay back some of that uh, humongous debt that we uh, incurred in building uh, Cobre Panama. So uh, it's quite a phenomenal story of resilience, uh, both in terms of the people on the sites, uh, but also in terms of our cooperation with the various governments and the different regimes. And I'll talk a little bit about that in Zambia as well. Um, so our cash costs are, uh, uh, as a group are coming down enormously. The last quarter, just over a dollar a pound, which when you see the copper price today at $3.10 or 12 wherever it is today, uh, that's, uh, that's pretty good. Um, so let's talk a little bit about mining in Africa and some of the benefits. Um, so in terms of Zambia, um, we've seen record production from our uh, second operation at Sentinel, uh, built about five years ago. Um, it's a complicated and quite uh, hard ore body. It's taken us a little while to get the, the site to ramp up to, to the full nameplate production. Um, but it's now roaring. It's really going well. Uh, and that's accompanied by lower cash costs and all-in sustaining costs. Uh, we've also seen a major upgrade to the Consanchi ore reserve this year. It's a mine that has continued to give over the last 15 years, uh, and it now looks like it's going to go on for much longer. Uh, and that feeds into a big decision for us in terms of the future of Consanchi uh, and whether we push ahead with a, a major expansion we call S3, the sulphide uh, expansion, which essentially triples uh, or doubles the, uh, the current sulphide production. Um, none of this would have been possible without uh, a really good working relationship with the government uh, in Zambia. We've had our ups and downs over the years, as most companies do. Uh, this year, I think the, uh, uh, the extreme pressure of the pandemic, uh, it's been well ma uh, managed in Zambia. Um, it's been a measured approach. The government uh, and most companies have worked well together uh, to try and mitigate the effects uh, of the pandemic. Uh, and that certainly worked for us well at Consanchi. We've had a uh, really negligible impact on uh, either Consanchi or Sentinel, uh, but not without a lot of work to, uh, to make that happen. Uh, we've also had a very consistent power supply this year, which uh, makes a change over previous years where drought has uh, really impacted the hydro schemes in Zambia. So a little bit on Consanchi. Um, it has been, for many years, the largest copper producer in Africa, uh, but it's about to be overtaken. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, it produces about 28 million tonnes of ore out of the pits every year at about 1% uh, uh, grade. Uh, it's been a fairly consistent producer, but as the oxide ore uh, gradually gets used up, we're heading into a deeper and lower grade part of the system. It's pretty consistent. It's what you see in porphyries and so forth around the world, and also the, uh, the African deposits. So this is a situation where if we want to continue producing copper at the same rate that we have in the past, then we need to uh, increase the milling circuit to, uh, to basically mill more tonnes to get the same amount of copper. That's a pretty significant investment that I'll talk about. Okay, so 20 production, uh, 2020 production this year is quite steady. Um, declining grades, cash costs very good, just over a dollar a pound. Um, and this major uh, upgrade of reserves. So you can see from th this graph that Consanchi started um, with a relatively modest uh, uh, feasibility uh, study reserve. Uh, it was around 2.7 million tonnes of contained copper uh, when it was built back in about 2004. Um, and we've had sort of fairly substantial incremental shifts about every three or four years where we've committed to a very large drill program. Um, this one in the September of this year was the result of one and a half million metres of drilling. Um, there's a few drilling companies in the room who'd probably be salivating over that. Um, but the effect is enormous in that it's added over two million tonnes of, of contained copper. So we went from a reserve of, of about 3.9 million tonnes of copper to six million tonnes of contained copper. Um, and that's over a billion tonnes uh, in total uh, resources and reserves uh, now at Consanchi, which is the largest reserve it's ever had. Uh, and this is a mine that's been operating for over 15 years and has already produced 3.4 million tonnes of copper, having started with a reserve of only 2.7, so it's pretty good. Um, a lot of people ask, where does the cash go? Because this really is a pretty interesting case study of a very successful mine in Africa. Um, I put this up last year and I've updated it because I think it's a, it's a really important uh, uh, thing to notice. Um, nearly $10 billion of free cash has come out of Consanchi in the period it's been operating over the 15 years since 2005. 
a very large proportion of that has been paid in direct taxes and royalties, nearly four, uh, over $4 billion, uh, including dividends to the uh, Zambian government, ZCCM being the state uh, miner there. Um, that's something like 84% of the uh, free cash uh, after investment or reinvestment has gone into the government. So it's a pretty significant contribution. Um, talking about the capital reinvestment, you can see the, the green side of that, uh, that pie graph. That's $4.3 billion, and that's the bit that governments tend to forget in terms of the requirement you need to reinvest in an operation to, uh, to make sure that it has a long future. Because we've already exceeded the original lifetime of Consentia, and it looks like it's still got another 24 or 25 years to go based on the, the current reserve. But if you don't put that investment in, then it will gradually be on the slippery slope of, uh, of declining grades and, uh, and economics. So really important that that reinvestment goes back into the operations, and that's, uh, uh, and that's certainly happened and will continue to happen at Consentia. So the second operation in Zambia is, is Trident, um, and uh, this has been uh, a consistent producer of around 200,000 tonnes of copper over the last few years. Um, this year it's really hit the straps. Um, when we drilled this out with the help of capital drilling, I can see capital drilling sitting near the back, um, a few years ago, um, we produced a, re a reserve of uh, a billion tonnes at half a percent. So we've mined, must be at least over 200 million tonnes since then, and somehow we've still got a reserve of, of 960 million tonnes. Um, so again, this is a mine that keeps on giving. Um, and uh, it's a phenomenal operation with some of the biggest mining kit that uh, money can buy. Um, it really is uh, uh, hit the straps this quarter. Um, cash costs down to $1.25. Um, and we've just increased the guidance on this operation to 250, 240 to 50,000 tonnes of copper this year, which is uh, an excellent result. Um, exploration in Zambia, it's, it's, in, it's strange how few players there are working in exploration in Zambia. Um, many of the drilling companies are always asking me why this is. Um, and I guess it has to do with the fiscal regime, um, that if it's, uh, if it's hard to justify expansions on your existing operations, and it's even harder to, to understand why one would go and invest in exploration for something that might be a decade, decade away. But we're there playing the long game, as are uh, one or two other players. Uh, Anglo and Rio have established programs there, and just a handful of juniors. Um, and I think if you hang in in the long term in Zambia, we will see the sort of discoveries that we've seen on the other side of the border in the Congo. Um, uh, it's just right now there really is a, a pretty limited program. But we're, we're busy. We've got three rigs uh, operating there during the last uh, quarter um, and some pretty nice things coming out of the ground. So Wallace Drilling from, uh, from Perth have uh, been doing an air core program with us. You can see the green stuff there is all copper uh, and the yellow stuff in that core is all charcoal pyrite um, and there's a deeper hole on a prospect nearby. Um, so there is plenty of copper still to be found in Zambia. Um, before we leave Africa, uh, our operation in Mauritania, Gelma Grain, is in, sadly in its last uh, throes of life, uh, as an open pit anyway, um, but it does have uh, perhaps quite a bright future reprocessing a lot of the tailings, um, both for, uh, for gold uh, and magnetite. Um, this year we produced nearly half a million tonnes of really high-grade magnetite, um, which certainly helped to bring our cash costs down. I think in the last quarter it was uh, uh, about 24 cents a pound of cash costs, so uh, one of the cheapest uh, mines in the world. Um, but we have a responsibility there to the community that's uh, uh, in Exus that's built up near the mine. Um, there are small businesses there that supply the mine and so forth, so we see a sustainable future there, perhaps in the, in the retreatment of tailings and some of the other businesses that have spun out of that. Very quickly, to round out, I just want to talk about some of the programs that we're doing, uh, particularly in our African operations, to, uh, to give back to those communities and make sure that, that we have a, first, uh, have a positive impact. Um, the key things for most Africans are health, uh, education and sustainable employment. Um, and really the theme that runs through all of those is education. Uh, and that's the legacy that we hope to leave when eventually our operations, as long life as they are, um, uh, end up uh, having to close down. Because education is something you can't take away from people. Education is there and it'll be a legacy uh, and it's sustaining for the future. We have an enormous program of uh, uh, training teachers, um, of sponsorships, of building schools, of uh, nutritional help for um, school lunches. Uh, and we've seen the impacts of that. We monitor this pretty closely. So daily attendance in schools has risen dramatically. 
uh, over the period this program has been going. Um, we've seen literacy rates rise from a sort of Zambian average of about 26% to uh, 50 to 80% in, in most of the schools around uh, where we're uh, assisting these programs. So, so that is really valuable for the future of Zambia and, and their kids. Um, this year in particular has been really important for us in terms of helping and working closely with the government on, uh, on a scheme whereby when the schools were shut back in March, we were able to keep lessons going on the air um, through, uh, through a school on the, the radio. Um, and that, uh, that included a sort of uh, typically African uh, um, system whereby the kids would buzz the teacher on the phone without making a call and the teacher would ring them back and we'd make sure the teachers all had phone cards so they could ask questions and so forth. It actually worked pretty well. 42,000 pupils were, were running on this scheme, um, but I think most of them are back in school now, which is great. Um, that's part of a much bigger uh, response to the pandemic in, in Zambia, um, where we have set up a, an IC unit, C unit, unit in the local hospital in uh, Solwezi. Um, tens of thousands of, of test kits um, and uh, obviously a lot of PPE and so forth. So working closely with the government to make sure that uh, that situation is, is well managed. And on the whole, it, it really has been. Um, other businesses in, uh, in Zambia, um, again, one of our uh, real emphasis is to make sure there is sustainable businesses left behind uh, once, once these mines eventually close. The biggest one of those is conservation farming. Uh, I've mentioned this in previous presentations, so I won't go on about it, but 40,000 farmers have now been trained uh, around the Solwezi district in conservation and farming. They've seen their crops go from slash and burn um, uh, farming, which is ecologically damaging, um, to, and, and really just uh, subsistence farming, through to actually producing more crops than they can eat and producing uh, things that they can export and sell in the markets, uh, so much so that they've had to set up new milling stations and everything. Uh, so it's been an incredibly successful program and one that we hope uh, will continue for a long time. Uh, this is a new one. This is a, a, an, uh, an art studio that's been set up by the, the uh, Consenti Foundation. Uh, you can go online to Facebook and Instagram and have a look at some of this stuff and indeed place an order should you wish. It's beautiful African jewellery made out of lovely Zambian copper uh, by some very talented local ladies. Um, very briefly, in the last few minutes, Latin America. Uh, it's becoming an increasing emphasis for, uh, for First Quantum. When we, uh, we built the Cobra Panama mine, uh, finished that last year, it was a $6.7 billion project. And it wasn't just a, a big plant, which you can see here and the pit in the background, uh, but it was also a port. Um, and uh, uh, some very big mills uh, and, a, and a power station which, when it's not being used for the mine, also uh, pumps into the national grid. Uh, it's a phenomenal operation and we're just beginning to see how, how powerful that uh, is going to be. Uh, even though, as I mentioned before, it was shut for, uh, uh, for several months, um, when we came back online, um, they've had a phenomenal quarter. So they started, uh, I think, on the 7th of July. Um, uh, 62,000 uh, tons of copper in that uh, in that quarter, and 20, uh, 28,000 ounces of gold. Cash costs coming down to uh, just over a dollar uh, a pound, um, and uh, and sales revenue in the order of 440 million in the quarter. Um, so year to date, even though it's been basically shut for a third of the year, um, it's uh, it's got a, a fairly phenomenal uh, cash stream as you can see. So that's going to be very important to us in terms of paying back that debt uh, and building a foundation for, uh, for the next set of operations we hope to build. Uh, couldn't uh, not mention Ravensthorpe, sitting here in Western Australia. Um, we fired Ravensthorpe back up earlier this year in April. Um, it's a difficult ore body. It's one that takes a lot of uh, patience uh, and innovation to, uh, to treat in this very complicated uh, uh, chemical plant. Um, and, uh, and we're, we're getting there slowly. It's, it's been a, a little bit of a frustrating ramp up process with some unplanned maintenance and so forth. When you shut a plant down, it's not always easy to get it to fire back up again. Um, but uh, we'll produce 13 to 15,000 tonnes of nickel this year. Uh, and I think things are beginning to settle down there now, which is uh, uh, also the reason that we're now starting a, a fairly major new construction project uh, called Shoemaker Levy, which is the next major ore body at, uh, at Ravensthorpe. Um, and we hope to be uh, digging there uh, early next year. Uh, includes a big overland conveyor coming into the plant because uh, it's about 10 kilometres from the main plant. 
So uh, it's had its challenges here in Western Australia. We're fairly isolated, uh, as many of you in this room will be aware, uh, and therefore getting a, a full workforce and recruiting those and getting them to site this, uh, this year has, has been pretty challenging. Two great new projects in the future, um, both Takataka Taka and Hakira in Peru. Um, they're waiting for us really just to complete the environmental uh, and engineering work that's required uh, and then to, uh, uh, to get the finance organised to build these projects. Um, that's about it. We're going to have questions now or later? No, I have questions now. Okay. Thanks very much.